All right, now, dear ones, last week I had mentioned in 1 Timothy 5, all the way to the beginning of chapter 6, Paul begins to show pastors how we must care and shepherd the church, which functions as the family of God. Now, in this week's verses, verses 3 through 16, Paul is going to give uh, Timothy and all pastors guidelines as to how we are to care for widows. The care for widows is something that we see in the Old Covenant, and now we see also in the New Covenant. Let me remind you, in the Old Covenant, God took a very dim view of the Israelites if they ever abused orphans or widows. In fact, let me read to you Exodus 22, verses 22 through 24. God said this, he says, You shall not afflict any widow or orphan. If you afflict them at all and their cry comes up to me, I will surely hear the cry and my anger will be kindled. And I will kill you with the sword and your wives shall become widows and your children fatherless. So that shows you just how seriously God took the mistreatment of orphans and widows. And not only were they not to be mistreated under the old covenant, there were provisions that they must be cared for. Well, today we see that the Apostle Paul is reappropriating that idea for the new covenant as well. Under the new covenant in the church, widows must be cared for. But today, Paul's also going to give guidelines as to how they should be cared for so that the church will not be unnecessarily fleeced or burdened. That's what we're going to be looking at today. Now, I want to begin by showing you the structure of Paul's thoughts. And what we have today is something called an inclusio. Now, what's an inclusio? Well, an inclusio is a section of scripture that is bracketed by a common theme. So you'll see one theme at the beginning and another theme at the end that is similar. So let me show you. And by the way, I'm indebted to a man named Phil Towner, who has a wonderful commentary on the book of First and Second Timothy, who spotted this. So here we begin in verse 3, where Paul is going to command, yes, the church must support genuine widows. And he will define then who the genuine widows are later on. Now we get to verse 4 in verses 7 through 8 and 16a. He talks about family responsibilities toward the widows. The family here is not the family of God, the church, but the biological family. And you're going to learn some important doctrine here for your Christian worldview. It is incumbent upon biological families to take care of their own. We're going to see that's a command from the Apostle Paul who speaks for Christ. We get to verse 5 and verses 9 through 10. Paul begins defining the genuine widows. Then we get to verse 6 and verses 11 through 15. He defines young and loose widows. Whereas the genuine widows deserve care from the church and support, the young and loose widows do not. A young, young widow will find out has to be remarried and start a family. The loose widow is a woman who has loose morals. And because of her loose morals, she demonstrates she's not a believer. Therefore, she must not be cared for by the church. Well, then here's the back end of the inclusio. Verse 16b, Paul comes back to the idea that the church must support genuine widows. So that's the inclusio. So roughly speaking, what you see in blue is what the church must do. It must support genuine or true widows. Everything in red is Paul defining which widows are genuine, deserving of support, and which ones are not. Now, again, because this is an inclusio, I think I would be doing a disservice to you if we did not study all of these verses together. And therefore, there's going to be a lot of verses. Normally, when I, Bob and I preach, we will give you the meaning of the text and at the end, the application. Well, today, the application is just the meaning of the text. I'll just be giving you a summary at the end, as you will see. So let's begin here with verse 3, where Paul commands the honoring of widows. He says, honor widows who are truly widows. Now, to me, one of the most important verbs here to define was the term honor. The verb here, tamao, certainly means to honor in the sense of giving respect to widows. Uh, for example, you'll see this in 1 Peter 2.17, where we as Christians are called to honor the king, which certainly involves respect. But it's more than that here. The honoring of widows also includes material or financial support. Now, what evidence would I give to you that suggests this? Well, just turn 14 verses later. Notice on the screen, Paul uses the cognate noun form of honor, 
the honor in 1 Timothy 5.3 as a verb, but he uses the cognate noun to show honor that must be given to pastors slash elders. And listen to what he says. 1 Timothy 5.17, Paul says, The elders who rule well are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work at preaching and teaching. So this double honor certainly involves payment. And we know that because the Apostle Paul goes on to say, look, he takes the Old Testament passage where, remember, the Israelites were not to muzzle the ox that was treading out the grain? Well, the point is the Israelites were not to muzzle the ox, preventing the ox from eating, because the ox was feeding them. In the same way, the pastor must be fed because he's feeding the flock. Therefore, he must be paid. Now, I cite this because it's an example of how honor can mean more than just respect. And I think certainly that's how it should be understand, understood Excuse me, in verse 3. It should be understood as financial support or material support. So, yes, we're to give financial or material support to widows. But now notice Paul says it's to those who are truly widows. And I like the ESV here, the Greek is antos keras, which literally means those who exist as widows or those who are truly widows. That's a good way of rendering it. So what Paul has succinctly stated to us is, yes, the church must take care of widows, but he set us up now to expect the definition of what a true or genuine widow is. And that's what he goes on to define here as we go. Now, as we come to verse 4, Paul's going to be, begin giving us the criteria as to which widows deserve support and which do not. Here you're going to see the first criteria has to do with widows that should not be supported because they must be supported by a biological family that exists to take care of them. Listen to what he says. Verse 4, he says, But if any widow has children or grandchildren, they must first learn to practice piety in regard to their own family and to make some return to their parents for this is acceptable in the sight of God. Now, notice, brothers and sisters, in the box, you have conditional language. And the conditional particle here, if, shows us that Paul is going to give us a condition as to which widows should not be cared for. In this instance, it's those who are going to be cared for by their biological family. In fact, he says that children and grandchildren, notice in the underline, they must first learn to practice piety in regard to to their own family. Now, let me pick apart a little bit of the words here that you see in the underlying portion. I'm going to pull up my pointer. It says, interest to me that when Paul says they must first learn, the term first here, protone, indicates that this should be the first priority of children and grandchildren. Now, let me let that sink in for just a moment. Who is the Apostle Paul? Well, he's a personal spokesman for Jesus Christ. So as he's writing this, we're hearing the very words of Christ. Christ himself was telling us that the first priority of children and grandchildren, the obvious idea is that they're old enough to do this, is that they are to take care of their aged parents and grandparents. Now, think about what America would look like, especially in the very self-centered generation that we live in, if this passage was believed. Yes, it's the first priority for us as children or grandchildren to take care of those who are aged. Okay, so what that means then is life isn't just about getting all we can here and now. It should be about setting aside money so that we can take care of mom or dad or grandma and grandpa. That is a godly virtue before the Apostle Paul and therefore before Christ. In fact, if they will do this, notice it's a form of practicing piety. The term there for piety is the one that we have from Eusebia, which is godliness. So an implication of this is it is godly to take care of your aged parents and grandparents, and it is ungodly behavior not to do so. Again, coming from the Apostle Paul. Another way of thinking about it is if you take care of your parents or grandparents or aged, that's acceptable in the sight of God. If you don't, it's unacceptable in his sight. Now, one of the reasons I want to labor this point is over the years, whether I was a pastor at Twin City Fellowship or now here at Gospel of Grace, many of you would come up to me and you would tell me, you say, you know what, I'm trying to care for my aged uh, grandmother or my aged mother or father. 
and my siblings will not help me. Well, this is a great passage to show them, to show that indeed they are obligated before God, and it should be a first priority in their lives to take care of aged parents and grandparents. Now, those of your siblings who are not believers, they're not going to probably care. But again, they still need to hear the obligation that they have before God. Now, one other thing I want to point out here is that Paul's saying that the biological family must care for its own. That's the way God designed the biological family. And as we're going to proceed, we're going to see the reason for that is so that the church is not unnecessarily burdened and doesn't simply become a welfare agency. That's the idea. So let's proceed now in verses 5 through 6 where Paul differentiates between valid and invalid widows. The valid widows deserve support. The invalid widows do not. Paul says, She who is truly a widow, left all alone, has set her hope on God, and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. Verse 6, But she who is self-indulgent is dead even while she lives. Now, notice in verse 5, Paul defines for us a valid widow. And notice the first criteria is that she's left all alone. In fact, the verb here, mano o o, <laughs> I think that's enough o's, mano o o, it's a perfect passive form of that. And the only reason I mention the grammar is because it indicates this is a condition that's probably not going to change. It will always be with her. So it's not as if her adult children or grandchildren just went away on vacation. She's abandoned. She's left all alone. And so the only family she has is the family of God. So the implication then is if a widow is genuinely alone, unable to care for herself, she must be cared for. The implication if she has biological family to do it, the biological family is obligated to do it as we saw in the previous verse. Now notice the second criteria you see in the blue she has set her hope on God. Now, this simply indicates that she's a believer. In fact, number, a number of times I've pointed out how hope, for example, in Romans chapter 8, is really synonymous with saving faith. Okay, so for example, in Romans 8, Paul says, by hope we've been saved. In Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, it's by, by faith we've been saved. So faith and hope are synonymous. Hope is simply looking forward typically to the future promises of God. But here, the widow that has hope in God is not simply just trusting that one day Christ is going to come back and raise her from the dead and give us a glorious kingdom. That's certainly true. But she's also trusting in the Lord for her daily provision. In fact, remember, Jesus modeled that in his model prayer. He prayed for daily bread. And so this woman is demonstrating that she's a believer because of her hope or her faith but notice also it says, and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. Does everyone see that after the blue? Now, does this mean that somehow the widow is trying to earn the payment that she gets from the church because after all she's engaged in prayer? No, no, no. The idea is she's demonstrating that she really is a believer. Why? Because she continues in prayer. The Apostle Paul commands all Christians, as he says, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, to pray without ceasing. So a person who prays is evidence that they are indeed, what? A believer. So a genuine believer who's left all alone as a widow must be cared for the, by the church. Now, in verse 6, Paul contrasts this with an invalid widow. And notice when he says about the invalid widow that she is self-indulgent. Now, this is a difficult term, to understand. It only occurs four times in our Bible, spatalao. Now, many scholars believe that spatalao, this idea of being self-indulgent, has to do with sexual immorality. And there may be a tinge of that in this term, but I think the term primarily means to be one who is greedy. Now, remember, the Bible never condemns outright people having money. What the Bible condemns is the fact that sometimes money has people, if you know what I mean. So the self-indulgent one is one who lives in a greedy way, in a hedonistic lifestyle, in which they are only concerned for themselves and their pleasure here and now. 
They're not concerned about God's promise of eternity. They're not con concerned about glorifying God or serving the saints or their family. They're greedy, hence self-indulgent. Now, to prove that that's the best rendering, let me cite another verse. This is from James 5.5. 5. Listen to what James says. He uses the same term rendered self-indulgent here, spatalao. He says, you have lived, he's talking about the unregenerate, luxuriously on the earth and led a life of wanton pleasure. That's spatalao. You have fattened, he says, your hearts in the day of slaughter. So wanton pleasure, self-indulgent, that's the idea. A woman who is concerned only with her own pleasure here and now. Okay, now, why would that be a woman who is an invalid recipient of church funds? Because it demonstrates that she's an unbeliever. Why? Because she acts accordingly. In fact, notice Paul says that she is dead. Now, that must be spiritual death because he says while she lives. So she's obviously alive physically, but she's spiritually dead. So remember, death is always separation. Physical death, separation of body and soul. Spiritual death is being separated from God. And that is the state of this woman who is greedy and self-indulgent. She is an unbeliever and therefore should not be given any support. Now, as we turn then to verses 7 through 8, we see the necessity, again, of biological family members to what? To care for their own so that the church is not burdened. Paul says in verses 7 through 8, command these things as well. Now, let me stop there. What things? Well, everything that he has said thus far, that yes, biological families are to take care of their own, is implied. So he continues, he says, so that they may be without reproach. But if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Now again, in verse 7, these things that Paul wants commanded are the things that he has taught thus far. Now I say that because notice here, one of the questions we have to wrestle with is in the box. When he says, so that they may be without reproach, who is the they? Is it believers? Is it the widows? Well, I think the they here certainly has to be the family, the biological family members of the widow that they are under obligation, as we see in verse 8, to financially and materially support the widow. And notice, if they do that, they will be without reproach. The implication is if they don't do that, they don't take care of their own, they will be under reproach. Now, who does the reproach come from? It comes from both men and God. You see, even in the Greco-Roman world, even the pagans knew that you as a son or a daughter or a grandchild had to take care of your aged parents and grandparents. So here, if you had Christians who weren't doing it, you would be a reproach even to the pagans. But of course, the most important issue is being a reproach before God. And again, God takes a very dim view of those who will not honor their father and mother. And by the way, Bob is going to be showing us more about what that means in our studies in Ephesians. Honoring our father and mother certainly stands behind all that Paul is saying here. Yes, honoring one's father and mother isn't simply just respecting and obeying, but it's also taking care of them in their aged condition. Now, notice in verse 8, what does Paul say for those who do not do this? He says, if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Brothers and sisters, this is an important biblical worldview to have, that the Bible teaches a work ethic. You know, years ago, there used to be a saying that in America, there was a Protestant work ethic. Where did the Protestant work ethic come from? Well, it came from people who were of the book who knew these things, who knew that they had an obligation to have a first priority to take care of their own. They knew that. Now, as the, the environment that we live in and our culture becomes more left-wing, we're losing that idea. But yes, the Bible teaches a work ethic. We have to overcome the thorns and the thistles and by the sweat of our brow care not only for ourselves, but for our family. 
This is something that is very biblical. Now, I'm going to give you some other verses here that support this idea of a work ethic. And by the way, before I read this, I want to say hats off to you men and women. I know many of you in here, and you do work hard. And God sees that, and he considers it godliness. In fact, I know a particular man right now who is working very, a very demanding and difficult job to care for his family. And hats off to him. Why? Because it's godliness. That's what God sees it as. Okay, so realize that working hard, no matter what job you have, as long as it's legal and it's moral before God under the terms of the new covenant, is something that God rewards. So let me give you some other passages. You don't have to turn to this one, but jot it down if you're a note taker. 1 Thessalonians 4.11. 1 Thessalonians 4.11, Paul says, Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life and attend to your own business and work with your hands just as we commanded you. Now, he talks about working with your hands. Why? Because that's the way the majority of work was done in the first century. That doesn't mean today if you're an office worker, somehow you're, you're not living out the, the commission that Paul gives here. No, you are. The idea is that you're to work. Now, let me show you another passage. Turn your Bibles to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 10 through 11. Turn your Bibles to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 10 through 11. All of these verses today, both in 1 Timothy 5 and the ones that we're reading, support a biblical worldview regarding work. 2 Thessalonians 3, 10 through 11, Paul says, For even when we were with you, we used to give you this order. If anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat either. Verse 11, For we hear that some among you are leading an undisciplined life, doing no work at all, but acting like busybodies. Now, dear ones, I want you to think about, do you think that these verses are ever preached in the churches that call themselves social justice churches? Do you think that's a popular message? If a man doesn't work, he doesn't eat to those who want the large welfare state? I don't think so. But dear ones, if these passages, I think if they were preached and they were believed across America, throughout the United States, you wouldn't have generations and generations of family members receiving welfare. You see, welfare is to be a stopgap to provide temporarily for those who can't help for themselves. It was never designed to be a lifestyle of generations and generations of family. Why? You have people who call themselves Christian, and yet generations of them are on welfare. What about if a man doesn't work, he doesn't eat? Well, we never hear that passage because we go to the church that's charismatic and worries about whether the man speaking is an apostle through his signs and wonders, or we worry about the man who claims everyone else other than them is a racist. That's what they want to hear. But they won't hear if a man doesn't work, he won't eat. You see, dear ones, I'll tell you a little secret most of you probably know. The left in America today, and it is a religious movement, they hate business owners. And the evidence of that is they always want to raise taxes on the business owner. And let me give you a little secret into Economics 101. I'm not an economist, but any time you tax something, you get less of it. So if we're going to tax businesses guess what? You're going to have less business. And if you have less business, you have less people hired. And you have less people hired, you have less people who can live out the biblical work ethic, excuse me, work ethic, I'm getting all riled up, that you find in the Bible. That's the problem. So we have to resist this. And that's why so many Christians for so many years have seen solace in the conservative mindset. That yes, it is godly to work. It is godly to start your own business. And if you don't want to start your own business, I always, I always laugh about people who put down the business owners. Oh, the wicked bourgeoisie. You see, Karl Marx hated the business owner. Why? Because they're the haves. And the worker was always the have-not. That was the breakdown. And that's what continues in the false religion of Marxism today. But I have to say to you, the true battle between the haves and the have-nots isn't between the employer and the worker. It's between those who work and the bureaucrat who keeps them from working. That's where the real battle is. I can't tell you how many times my wife has been hung up on by those who work for the state. 
while she's trying to employ people. I've seen it myself when I was a flight instructor and I work for a business. They're always being pounded on by those who know better. No, hatred of business owners is an attack on the biblical work ethic taught in the Bible. It is unbiblical. It is from Satan. It is from the pit of hell. No, the Bible teaches you take care of your own. And if you cannot, because you're a widow, you're aged, what have you, then you have the family of God. That's what the scriptures teach. So if we had a biblical worldview, dear brothers and sisters, think about what our land would be like. This is one of the benefits, brothers and sisters, of teaching verse by verse. I have to tell you, on my own biases, would I ever select this passage if I didn't teach verse by verse? Would I ever say, you know what, today I think I'm going to talk about widows. Maybe I would. This is the benefit of teaching verse by verse. Because, see, my biases don't rule out the whole counsel of God. That's what the church must be engaged in. Let's teach the whole counsel, and therefore people hear all that God has to say. Okay, so notice in verse 8 at the very end, those who deny taking care of their loved ones are worse than an unbeliever. And this really ties us back to verse 4, where those who do take care of their family members, remember they were showing godliness. The idea is if they do not, they're not showing godliness. Again, the church must take care of widows who can't take care of themselves. But what Paul wants to make sure is that biological families take care of their own. So again, the church is not unnecessarily burdened. Now, here we come to verses 9 through 10, where we see that there's more criteria that a woman must fit to receive support as a widow. Paul says, Let a widow be enrolled if she is not less than 60 years of age, having been the wife of one husband and having a reputation for good works, if she has brought up children, has shown hospitality, has washed the feet of the saints, has cared for the afflicted, and has devoted herself to every good work. Now, notice here in verse 9, Paul has some criteria that he has for a woman to be given support. Notice he says, if she is not less than 60 years of age. Why was that age given as a cutoff point? Well, it's very interesting in doing the research, when you look at antiquity, when you hit 60 years of age in the ancient Near East, you were considered an old man or woman. Now, I hate to break that to many of you in here, but realize back then they didn't have hip replacements, knee replacements, and all the medicines and goodies that we have today to keep us young. No, their bodies took a tremendous beating, especially in the hardships that they went through. So if you were 60, you were over the hill. The idea then is Paul wanted to reduce the amount of people, uh, women, on the widow rolls. You see, in Ephesus, there was an epidemic. There were many women, apparently, who wanted to be enrolled as a widow to be taken care of by the church. What Paul wanted is women who could remarry and start a family. He wanted that to happen. So that's why he uses the age 60. Now, saying that, don't make this so hard and fast that if there was a 48-year-old woman, for example, in Paul's day, who was paralyzed and she had no family, I don't think the church is going to throw her out. That's not the point. But there had to be some limitation for the normal categories. And that's why Paul gives the age of 60. Notice also, it says, having been the wife of one husband. Now, literally in the Greek, it's being a one-man woman. Now, recall back in 1 Timothy 3, 2, that was a criteria for being an elder. A man had to be a one-woman man. Well, now it's reversed. If you're going to be a qualified widow, you have to have been a one-man woman. Hope I get that right. So the point is she had to be faithful to the husband that she had lost. And why? Well, because that's evidence again of what? Of being a believer. That's the idea. Now, we come to that in verse 10. Notice it says, in having a reputation for good works. Again, does that mean that somehow a widow is earning the support? No. But the good works are evidence that she's a true believer. And it's true believers that must be cared for. Now, why do we say good works are evidence of being a believer? Well, remember Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 says, For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But in verse 10, it says, For we are his workmanship, 
created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So in Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, we're saved by faith, all by God's grace. But the works in verse 10 necessarily follow. So the idea then, if you don't have any works or good works, it's evidence that you're not a believer. That's the idea. So the reason I cite that is notice in verse 10, Paul has an if. Whoops, I forgot my first if. Notice the second if. He says, if she has brought up children, has shown hospitality, has washed the feet of the saints, and there's all these criteria. So don't think that you had someone in the church that was checking the box and say, oh, last Thursday she was washing the feet of the saints. No, these are representative good works that are indicative of a believer back then. And by the way, some might say, well, wait, she had to bring up children. What about a widow who never had children? Well, again, bringing up children is just evidence that she didn't reject her gender role. That was going on in Ephesus. Remember in 1 Timothy 2, women, women were saved by, by childbearing. And we said, no, childbearing doesn't save you in and of itself. What Paul was saying is they did not reject their gender roles. That was the heresy going on in Ephesus because they had believed that the resurrection already occurred. If the resurrection already occurred, then the distinctions between the genders, male and female, didn't matter. So the idea then is if a woman would do what a woman does, it was evidence that she had not rejected the biblical worldview. She didn't adopt the doctrines of the false teachers. Now, one point I want to point out is, notice the if, the second one that I have in the box. In the original Greek, there were actually five ifs. Okay, the ESV just condenses it down to one. But again, all of the works there are not exhaustive. So if you're sitting there today and you're thinking, well, I've never washed the feet of the saints, well, that's something we typically don't do now because we have modern footwear. But back then, it was something that was routinely done for brothers and sisters in Christ because of the conditions in which they lived. Okay, now, let's continue on, verses 11 through 13, where Paul talks about the treatment of young widows. He says, But refuse to enroll younger widows, for when their passions draw them away from Christ... They desire to marry and so incur condemnation for, their, for having abandoned their former faith. Besides that, they learn to be idlers, going about from house to house, and not only idlers, but also gossips and busybodies saying what they should not. So notice Paul here says that young widows must not be enrolled to be taken care of, but then notice how he explains why. Does everyone see in the box the four? That's an explanatory for. So this tips you off as to the reasoning behind Paul's rationale. He says, for when their passions draw them away from Christ, they desire to marry. Now let's just stop there. Let me point my pointer here to the term passions. This is a very difficult term to define because it's what's called a hot pox legomena, meaning it only occurs once in our Bible. But there is a derivative form that's found in Revelation chapter 18, where certainly it has to do with sexual immorality. So Paul is talking about sexual desires that these young women would have that would draw them away from Christ and their desire to marry. Now, we have to stop there and be careful because, remember, marriage in and of itself is not sinful. Okay, remember, in fact, Paul said one chapter earlier in 1 Timothy chapter 4, the false teachers who denied marriage, who said that you can't be married, what were they teaching? A doctrine of demons. So I don't think Paul, one chapter later, is going to be contradicting himself. So we're given further help as to what Paul means by it in verse 12. Notice in the underlines, he says, and so incur condemnation for having abandoned their former faith. Okay, now here's why I like the ESV again. Notice the term faith there. The term in Greek is pistis, and most often it should be rendered faith. It has to do with the faith that we have in Jesus Christ for salvation. Okay, But some of your versions, like the NASB, which I typically use, will cite it as being a pledge. Why? Well, because those scholars would see that these women were making a pledge of celibacy, therefore to serve Christ, and they broke it, and therefore they're incurring condemnation. I don't think that's the point. 
I think we should take pistis as it's normally rendered, and that is they abandoned their faith. Now, why did they abandon their faith? Because, first of all, they were tempted to marry an unbeliever. You see, marriage is never wrong in and of itself, but a believer must marry another believer. But because there were so many unbelieving, unregenerate men to choose from, that would be a temptation for many of these younger widows in the congregation of Ephesus. That was the issue. Now, have, turn your Bibles, if you will, to 1 Corinthians 7, verse 39. 1 Corinthians 7, 39, because what I want to show you is where we see very clearly this idea that, yes, it's okay to marry, but it must be with another believer. 1 Corinthians 7, 39. Remember, you and I are morally bound to the terms of the new covenant. And so this is where we see some moral binding. Yes, we can be married, but it must be to another believer. 1 Corinthians 7, 39, Paul says, a wife is bound as long as her husband lives, but if her husband is dead, she is free to be married to whom she wishes, only in the Lord. Now, does everyone see that last phrase, only in the Lord? That shows us that, yes, men and women are free to marry who are believers, but it must be to another believer. The temptation for the women at Ephesus, these young widows, is that there were far more unbelievers to choose from. And so the idea then that Paul was concerned with is because of their passions, their sexual desires, they'd be led astray to these unbelievers and they would abandon their former faith. This was particularly prevalent in Ephesus, where if you married a Greco-Roman man, he would require you, if you were his spouse, to take and adopt his religion. Therefore, you had to leave your own. That's what Paul was concerned with. So putting that together then, Paul's not saying that it's wrong to marry. He's not talking about a vow of celibacy. He's saying that these women would be tempted to go after unbelievers and abandon their former faith that they had in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Paul gives another reason, though, why young widows should not be supported. That's in verse 13. That's because he says they're, they're prone to be idlers, gossips, and busybodies. In fact, I think what was going on in Ephesus is that many of the false teachers' doctrines were being promulgated by these, women's, these women who were going house to house. Okay, so Paul didn't want droves of young women who had nothing to do. We've all heard the saying that idleness is the devil's workshop. No, over and over in the scriptures, we see that both men and women are always commanded to be engaged in work in serving the Lord Jesus Christ, serving the brothers and sisters in the family of God. Idleness is never a good thing. And so that's why Paul wanted them to start a new life. In fact, here he gives his admonition to the young widows. In verses 14 through 15, he says, So I would have younger widows marry, bear children, manage their households, and give the adversary no occasion for slander. Verse 15, he says, For some have already strayed after Satan. So here Paul is saying, yes, the younger women should marry. So obviously Paul isn't prohibiting marriage. That wasn't the issue. But they had to be married in the Lord, as we saw in 1 Corinthians 7.39, and they had to learn to manage their own household. That way, they're not going to be idlers or busybodies or gossips. Why? Because they're too busy to do those things. Yes, again, work is always a good thing, and it's always something that comes from God. Notice, those who will not do that are open to the adversary. Do you realize that Satan is depicted as being in heaven? We talked about this in Sunday school. In Revelation 12, he launches allegations against the brethren day and night. And what he does is he accuses us of being lawbreakers. What Paul was concerned about is that there would be merit to these allegations because of the life of the widows. And so the adversary is certainly Satan, as you see in verse 15, who causes people to stumble, but also launches allegations against them when they do. Paul wanted women to take upon themselves the duty of raising a family and give no opportunity for idleness in their life. One of the issues that, again, was going on in Ephesus, remember the false doctrine. The false doctrine was that the gender distinctions didn't matter anymore. And many of these women probably wanted to be a new liberated woman. And so they were young and they thought, wow, what a great life. I'm taken care of by the church. 
And I get just to go around house to house and have fun. No, Paul doesn't want that. Paul doesn't want young people to be unburdened by the cares of life. He wants them to have a work ethic, to serve God, and to serve their families. That's one of the things that we see clearly in the scriptures here. Now, finally, we come to verse 16, where Paul comes all the way back to the original thought that he had in verse 3. This is the end of the inclusio. Verse 16, he says, If any believing woman has relatives who are widows, let her care for them. Let the church not be burdened, so that it may care for those who are truly widows. Brothers and sisters, notice that in the black. Paul says that a woman must take care of her relatives, widows that are part of her biological family, for what purpose? So that the church must not be burdened. You see, the Apostle Paul knew that the church would be overwhelmed with too many widows. The role of the church as the family of God is to pick up the slack when the biological family cannot. And that's why he says in blue, so that, here's the purpose. Why does the biological family have the role to take care of its own? So that it may care for those who truly are widows, that is, the church can. If the church has to take care of everyone, it won't be able to take care of anyone. That's the point. And I want you to think about how a widow who has nothing else, she has no family, she's abandoned, she's all alone, and she placed her trust in God and the family of God, how she must not be let down. The family of God must never let a genuine widow down. Why? Because it is within God's heart to be compassionate on those who cannot do for themselves. And I say that because as I give you the summary Um, Well, in fact, I'll talk about this in the next slide. When I was a brand new Christian, I always used to think that God would help those who help themselves. Well, that wasn't good theology, and I learned later. I'll talk about that in a moment. But let me give you a little bit of a summary. This is what Paul is laying out for us. First of all, widows must be supported. And, of course, these are genuine widows, and what Paul did is he defined them if they are believers. That's the most important thing. The church is not in the business of taking care of every person on the planet. That's not the role of the church. Many people think it is. No. The role of the church as the family of God is to first and foremost bear the burdens of fellow brothers and sisters. So yes, they must be a believer. B, they have to be 60 years or older. Why? Because again, Paul wanted the younger widows to remarry. Now again, this isn't a hard and fast rule. There's some 52-year-old woman in She's not able to take care of herself. She's abandoned. There's no family to take care of her. Yes, the church will step in. But this is a guideline, certainly, that Paul thought was important. C, if they have no one else, that's exceedingly important. A widow who couldn't take care of herself. Remember, in the ancient Near East, it was very difficult physical work. And a woman wasn't going to do that. She wasn't just going to get a part-time job at the Gap. Okay, no, they didn't have that back then. It was going to be physical work, so she couldn't take care of herself. So if she was abandoned, it had to come from the church. Now, these are the widows who are not to be supported if they're unbelievers. Unbelieving widows are not to be cared for by the church of God. If they're young widows, again, why? Because young widows are to start over. They're to be remarried and they're to start their lives over where they start a family and are engaged in rearing and caring for the family and the family of God. C, if they have other support. Again, if a widow has a biological family, let the biological family first demonstrate their godliness, as Paul said, by taking care of them so that the church is not burdened. Uh, One of the reasons I wanted to put this message together the way I did is I wanted to be almost a little handbook for us as elders and deacons that we can look at and say, look, we have a widow that we have to address. How do we do it? Well, hopefully this message will give us some clear direction. Let me conclude with this. As I mentioned earlier, When I was a brand new Christian, and probably before, I believed in the saying that God helps those who help themselves. What's very interesting is when you start reading the Bible, the opposite is actually true. God helps those who cannot help themselves. You see, all of us are lost sinners. All of us would be lost and on the way to perdition if it were not God's grace and mercy and his compassion. Because God is a God of compassion, he demonstrates that he cares for those who cannot care for themselves. And this is why God cares and has a special heart for widows and orphans. We see this 
emphasized in Psalm 68, 5 here, where God is depicted as a father of the fatherless and a judge for the widows, is God, it says, in his holy habitation. That's the heart of God. He takes care of those orphans and widows who can't take care of themselves. Brothers and sisters, today we learn that we have to have a heart like his. As the church, the family of God, we have to care for our own within the family of God who cannot care for themselves. And this is why James said in James 1.27, pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. Brothers and sisters, we have to have a heart like God. We must be those who help those who cannot help themselves. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you that you give us clear instructions as to how we are to care for widows, how we are to care for those that don't have family. And I do pray that we would take these words seriously to our heart, that we'd also be convicted of our need as biological family members to take care of our aging parents and grandparents, that we would see this as a first priority. I pray, Lord, for us that we'd also keep and develop a biblical work ethic, that we would see work not as some evil, but as something that you've ordained, something that will become greater and easier and even more glorified in the kingdom to come. We pray that you would do this for us in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand, if you will, for the benediction. From Jude 24 and 25. It says, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, not keep you stumbling, as I said last week, and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forevermore. Amen. God bless all of you. Have a wonderful Sunday and a wonderful week.